Guys, welcome to this bonus episode of Pop Kitchen. Today, we are going to be doing a spoiler conversation for Martin Scorsese's latest film, Killers of the Flower Moon. If you haven't yet heard George's review from last week, please go and check it out. That is a spoiler-free review of the film. Since you've seen it, I've now had the chance to see it. By the time this comes out, the film will be out. No, it's out. It'll be it's out already. Be out. Yeah, it's already out already. Um, and of course, we'd love to hear your thoughts if you haven't already sent them in. So send your thoughts into hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. But George, just in case people have got no idea what film we're talking about, Killers of the Flower Moon, very quickly. So... Latest film from Martin Scorsese about uh, a true life story of um, 1920s Oklahoma in Osage County, where uh, the Os- people of the Osage tribe, Native American tribe, were murdered um, in several in high numbers uh, at a time when the Osage people were very wealthy and affluent as a result of discovering oil on their land, and you have a lot of white. Uh, characters trying to inveigle themselves into the families of the Osage tribe and the Osage people to get their hands on their money and their property, uh, bearing with it a lot of violence. So, you know what's interesting about going to see this film is that one of the things I think probably like needlessly has been hanging over going to watch this film is the runtime. Yeah. It's three and a half hours long. You and I have sort of been discussing it a lot and how we yeah. plan around that. And it's like, even though it's Martin Scorsese and we're very excited by it, it's a little bit like, oh, I've got to settle yeah. in for it. And I remember like jokingly between you and I saw it with your girlfriend, I was like, I need to like stop drinking water then yeah. and I'll need to pee right before and then I'm not going to drink till like an which hour and a half. Thing, which is totally uncool. It's just like not what is interesting about this film. Yeah. And I got to my, we got to this like press screening, which was great. Had the most comfy seats I could ever hope for. And I was like, oh, for three and a half hours, this is great. Yeah. And it had the reclining yeah. and I was reclining. I was like, great, I can like lean back and just let this wash over. And funnily enough, you know, I, I got into the film and I started leaning back, but very quickly within an hour, I sat forward and I was watching it mm. forward. And it was just, I completely agree with you. I think Martin Scorsese had such a masterful grasp and mm. understanding of how to tell that story. Mm. It was like metronomic in its pace yeah. and how it went through. And literally the, the score, the, 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 the plucking guitar yeah. underneath it literally ticks you through. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think Robert De Niro is kicking into a completely higher gear. Isn't he just? And, you know, I think of the Scorsese I've seen, it's actually some of the most sinister mm. storytelling I've seen from him, mm. but less so of like a depiction of violence, but mm. in this, this, this nasty understanding between the audience and the characters of what's really going on underneath. Mm, mm. And I just found it like there's sort of moments in, in the late second hour, which are really difficult to watch, like certain scenes and mm. like spo- spoiler territory now, like when, when you know, when Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio's character is really in like the depths of poisoning, oh, yeah. Molly. poisoning Molly and you're just, and he's like kissing her neck while, while she's there and the stench of death is following his character and the flies. Yeah. And, um, oh yes, that's a yeah, good symbolism. Yeah, yeah, and uh, everyone, everyone's just great. I thought Jesse Plemons was brilliant. Yeah, I feel like he's so good at letting really great dialogue speak for itself mm. and knowing when to just let someone else react mm. or to le- leave a space. I'd re- I had a really good time with it. I yeah. think it deserves to be in the conversation next to films like There Will Be Blood as one of yeah. the great the great cinematic art pieces as a commentary on the formation of American society yeah. and greed and capitalism and seeing strands of where our society is mm. now through to those moments in time. It's really good, isn't it? It's really, really good. It's a good. really good film. I, I, I just I just did a, the, pe- the, the, the length was there, but I was interested in every part of did, it. Did you have that feeling I did where as soon as it begins, you're kind of yeah. like, oh, I'm so just like, fine. I'm so, grip i'm just there and it's just like here we are i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna, gonna drip feed you the story yeah. very consistently very consistently. and every single moment i was like I, i'm very curious as to what happens next yes. yes and even though a lot of the delivery it doesn't it doesn't scream and shout a lot of it sort of whispered you know whispered yeah. like under that and a lot of the responses mm. are yeah we can yeah. we can do that under this and so it's very much at the same tone i read a good review that said that the genius, the, we're just talking about the runtime. Yeah. And this critic was Sorry like- Sorry to labor, it's just, it has no, been on my mind going into it. But this critic made this point about the runtime where he was like, what you, what, his theory is that what the extended runtime enables you to do is realize how long it took before any justice was- Yeah. yeah how long it took, because Jesse Plemons, I want to say turns up two and a half hours. Yeah, in. yeah, it's in the third hour. It's really, really long time. Yeah. And like, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, 
just the thing about Jesse Plemons' character, when I saw- And Scor- the film starts, people have already died. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When Scorsese, when I saw him talk, the original version of the script pre-COVID mm. was- Leo was going to play Jesse Plemons' character. I totally see that. And the film would have begun, he would have been one of the, you know, formate, f- the formation of the FBI coming down to Oklahoma. Yeah. But it just says a lot about how much the film has changed that you, you actually have two and a half hours prior to that yeah. now before that even comes. Um, yeah, I agree when you said about the, the upper register, the, the higher gear for yeah. De Niro. I just what, was watching him thinking, I haven't seen you this switched on in such a long time. Yeah. He was great in The Irishman. So oh yeah, of course, like, of course. A few but, years ago. But, do you remember yeah. when on The Irishman, he's like, he's kind of reacting to everyone. He's yes, kind of, the, yeah. he's being taken through. In the same way that Leo kind of reacts to a lot in this. Yeah. But um, he's great. Um, what have I seen Lily Gladstone in before? Well, not a lot of, uh, nothing as big as this. She's, she's done a bit of TV. Yeah. yeah, absolutely fantastic. She did a lot. She's done a couple of Kelly Reichardt films, those kind of small indie films. But yeah, she's brilliant. She's this. really, like, really good. What, and again, like not not shouting and screaming for an Oscar, mm. which I definitely think she'll be nominated. Oh, not absolutely. All of them, I think, will be. Yeah. The... Um, because what was great is, so I, because I'd seen it, I gave up my ticket to my girlfriend to go in, yes. in, my, in my place. So I was really glad you guys got to see it together. And Anna came home and we, we chatted about it. And like, we were talking about the, the violence in the film. And what I said to her before she went, I said, you know, the violence in it is very cold. It's really yeah. just clinical. It's kind of like pop. Matter of fact, yeah. Very matter of fact. And like the scene where they kill... Um, sorry, the sister, Anna, Anna. Anna in the woods. Yeah. yeah like and you know that's happened. It's not it's a surprise. Clumsy. It's clumsy. They, they clumsy kind of hold her up straight and shoot her down. And she kind of stops. And, and she, she falls over. But then, you know, her dress. The way that, like, and, everyone's not killed properly. Because, like, you know, you've got to shoot them through this way. And it's just so clumsy and flimsy. And, yeah. Oh. The bit I missed, by the way, I mentioned that I was yeah. I had to like nip out. So I got up. So the, there's that great scene in the Masonic Lodge where he spanks. Yes, that, yeah, which yeah. is just brilliant. Tells them all. So that scene ended. I got up because I, I don't know if you found this, but like I said, the first ninety minutes, it was every scene seemed really important. Yeah. So I really struggled to get. I mean, the whole film really. I couldn't cut it. Yeah, I yeah. got out of that, and I was like, I don't know but where I cut maybe it. Maybe when Jesse Plemons turns up, but that's not an, that's not even. That's not. <laughs> I'm in though. I'm yeah. in. I'm there. Sorry. Anyway, so. He spanks him in the Masonic Hall. That scene ends. I get up. As I'm walking out, that's when the private detective gets murdered. Yeah. And yeah. I see that. Run upstairs. Because the toilets are upstairs in this cinema. So I'm going to go all the way down. <laughs> Run all the way down. And I walk in and the bank vault has exploded with lots of like yeah, dollar bills around. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this seems really important. But it's just like, it's really but, like but one yeah, passing moment. Luckily, yeah, my girlfriend explained that it was just about the dynamite. It, it, it felt like, you know, that it felt like a top tier HBO dense historical series that yeah. I'd sat down and binged. Yeah. But not in a way that it felt like I was... I saw like lots of different pacing structures in one, yeah. but just in terms of the amount of detail and the amount of attention yeah. that I imagine goes into telling a much longer story yeah. over multiple hours is, um, I would like to see it again. Yeah, me too. Enough, That's the uh, thing. Even I, though coming out of that, uh, I'd love to see it again. I'd love to watch it with subtitles. Do you think you're going to save it for the small screen to rewatch it? Yeah, I don't know. I might see how I feel coming into next week and whether mm. or not I, I fancy it and if I've got the time to see it. Because I think a friend of mine was interested in seeing it and I'm like... Yes, preliminarily, but just timing wise and thing. But what I'll, is, I'll, it deserves a rewatch. Absolutely, for me, 100%. That, that's the thing. You're like, there's so much in there, and it's so well made. You can yeah. really dive back in. I thought it was really interesting. Like, even you brought this point up in your review about how, like, the presentation of white people being poorer than the Native Americans in mm. this county, which we've just not really seen depicted. And when when Molly starts to become aware of the danger and the sort of slightly nasty undercurrent of white people coming off this train yeah. and into their state. And they're depicted like this disgusting, wretched, scarred yeah. swarm. Uh, and, and I just thought that was such an interesting it's, interesting thing. Yeah, sorry, it, it, it's flipping the lens. It's 100%. like, if you take how Native Americans would have been depicted you know, 50 years ago or in film history, yeah. as one dimensional savagery, you know, just a complete misrepresentation. Yeah. And what I think Scorsese does really well is re- is flip that, and you have this like like I said, really well cast, like o- uh, ensemble of white characters who are mean faced and kind of mm. like th- that so wear, wear so much drama on their face. Yes, I thought so. I thought it was interesting is how like you know the the Osage tribes spirituality is very important and they have traditions and it's something that like you can see runs through their blood and through generations of their family. But the the white characters who come off the trains in this almost they sort of exchange it like a token and they wear mm. it like just a dressing yeah. to absorb. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's it's sinister and nasty, but it never needs to tell you it. You understand from yeah. the get-go. And you know what, funnily enough, like a lot of the a lot of what I thought, a lot of what happened in the end, I kind of could see coming. Mm. I kind of thought, you know, 
Urs Burkhart kind of going to end up in this position where he'll either get killed or he'll be torn between mm. warring fat, like very much powerful heads trying to manipulate him because he doesn't really have yeah. the wits to either understand. I think the horrors of what he's doing mm. and the implications of it, and like dim. who and who he's working for and what actually is at stake. And it's that wonderful shot when. Brendan Fraser invites him into this room. It's mm. very oh. much like old school chairs. The whole pub. white community is there. The whole white community. It's the entire oil industry yeah. trying to basically get him to not say a stupid thing. Yeah. And you realize what's at stake here. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, just um, this sense that Ernst Burkhart and William Hale were as slippery and as slimy as the oil running under the soil yeah. beneath them. Yeah. Just horrible. Yeah. Horrible, horrible, horrible. I, what I liked about the ending, where we have this kind of coda, where it cuts to a radio play. Yes. Being yeah. shot. And the cameo I mentioned was from Jack White of the White Stripes. I don't know if you oh, saw no, that. I didn't He's one of the people reading out of the radio. And I was like, Jack, oh, no. Jack White? Yeah. Um, and then obviously Martin Scorsese comes on. Yes. And has, which I thought was a really kind of fun, witty... Didn't bother me. Polite. No, it didn't bother it me. It was the last line of dialogue for the film. So yeah. it's like... There wasn't, wasn't le there wasn't an exchange left apart yeah. from him to just sign, exactly. sign his signature on the film, exactly. essentially. And um, what I like about that, that little radio hour play thing, it kind of was taught, for me, it was like about how different cultures uh, deal with these stories and subsume these stories. So it's like in the kind of white American mm. culture, this story was kind of remembered as a kind of frivolity, a kind of uh, fun radio hour anecdote. Yeah. It becomes anecdotal. Whereas for the, you know, the Osage people, this was a deep, deep trauma and is remembered yeah. probably, you know, for gener will be remembered for generations and yeah. not just in a half hour radio play like it is for the, the, the white audience. Um, I also think that you mentioned Brendan Fraser. I, you know, great to have Brendan Fraser back in mm. general. Um, he's in this for about five minutes. And yeah, that's like more scenes than you, I think you said. He's got like three, four scenes. It's st still probably five minutes of runtime. Oh, like okay, okay, anyway, fine. Yeah, he's, but, he's a small part of it. And it is clear that he's either filming this during the whale or, yeah. or just after he's the whale. He's carrying a but lot of whale, whale weight. I, I, I don't want to denigrate his performance at all, but what I liked in that scene when he brought him into the room, right? The very first, oh no, sorry. Yeah, with, all the, with all the white people in, yeah. the, in the room. Um, I... I, I just I, I felt like saying to Brendan Fraser, I think it's evident that you've been sat in a role for for ages. You know, because as in the whale, he's sedentary. Yeah, sure, yeah. And Brendan Fraser is stood up, and honestly, I feel like he doesn't know what to do with his hands. He's like, <laughs> "You <laughs> must decide which to row to take. They beat <laughs> you and tortured you. I have not consulted with my <laughs> yeah. client. And I think he stands and John up. John Lithgow is like, "There is no precedent for this." I think <laughs> honestly, part of Brendan Fraser's brain is like, "I'm stood up, and I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> yeah. I've been." sat down for three miles. Um, I love just, I think it's such a big director flex to have the likes of Clemens, Lithgow yeah. and Fraser come in two and a half hours into your film yeah. and like have like decent roles to play in that. Mm. And like, it's sort of an Oppenheimer-esque courtroom yeah. legal drama going on, but less, dis less disorienting than I think Well, well, well actually, Oppenheimer, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I think watching Killers of the Flower Moon mm. made me kind of crystallize some things how I felt about Oppenheimer. Yeah. And, and actually as a compliment to Killers of the Flower Moon, because my thing with Oppenheimer was that by the time I got to the end, I just felt like I'd been pummeled with someone reading someone's biography at me, just throwing information at me incessantly for for three hours. Not to say I didn't like it, I, but I just found it exhausting by the end. I was yeah. like ready for the film to end. But I never felt that with, no. with this. No. And, you know, that's why, you know, Kids of the Flower Moon is just a, on a higher tier yeah. than something like Oppenheimer. Scorsese is a better filmmaker than Nolan. And don't get me wrong, Nolan's got, you know, 40 which is, years which to catch is up. Fine. Which is no fine. No one's a better filmmaker, fine. really, than Scorsese. Exactly. Yeah. But, like, what Scorsese is doing, he's giving so much chance for you to think and for you to engage, and the silences, it's really clever. The, the, the thing I was thinking about, like, there's so many things that Scorsese doesn't have to do in this film yeah. to engage you, but he does, and he does successfully. Because, obviously, with every chance, everything he does is always a risk that it won't work. But, my, but that bit towards the end where a new Native American uh, character arrives in town. He's this young young mm, man. Yeah. And the camera sort of lingers on him and follows him and kind of threads him into the scenes. Here and there, and, Very and, carefully. Yeah, and, and you're kind of thinking, who is this guy? And then obviously, you know, a few, probably 20 minutes later, it's just revealed that he's one of the FBI agents, yeah. right? Spy. 
and that's it. There's no other great reveal about that character, but it's, but it's just an excellent way of mm. conti- keeping you hooked into the story. Um, and that whole idea of like people not knowing what the Federal Bureau investigators yes. were, and that yeah. introduction of like government investigating the business out of state. Yeah, that's quite an interesting part just to weave into history. Like federal, it's yeah. like. Joe Pagetti plans very casual about it. Yeah. That's what he's doing. I love that scene with um, De Niro where, he, where he's like, I don't want my money in Denver. I want to get it here. Mm. You know, I don't want to speak to Denver. Oh, he's just. And so I think, good. I think maybe wrongly in my head, again, like completely uninformed about the history. When you, when you hear about lands and pro- property and wealth being stolen from Native Americans, you think about like, uh, you know, big swarming of people running in and killing and taking it immediately yeah. in one in one evening. But what this film does so well is that this didn't happen overnight. This oh, yeah. wasn't one siege. This was slowly infected through generations yeah. of uh, marriages and children and yeah. slowly poisoning and ousting people from the land that, that, that they grew up on. Like, that's such an, in- that's the thing yeah. I didn't really think I think about is how it was just this slow, poisoning of, of everything it's a really brilliant film it's really good and Anna thought the exact same thing when i got home she was she was she thought it was one of the best films she's ever seen actually it's really really uh, good and, and i yeah i can't i can't wait to watch it again and just on again to label this point of people going three and a half hours god i don't want to see a film and it's like yes in so many ways you are right and i think this year we've seen so many three-hour films this year from blonde to babylon to avatar like just to know if you, i feel like there's been a lot yeah. this year what I will say is that, like, yes, you can see this on the small screen, but I really do urge you to give yourself over yeah. to that big screen experience. Challenge mm. yourself to be locked in the room and trust in, of all the filmmakers to do yes. this, Martin Scorsese really is the one. This is the one time where I, like, just, just forget about the runtime, take the evening off and go and see it. And I promise you, you'll get more out of it than if you saw it at home stopping and starting or split over two nights, which is realistic how I'm going to probably have to watch it next time mm. I do. But I'm so glad i've experienced it in this way with martin scorsese to just let me let me just take this for you and tell you the story it's it's a really special moment to get that i also think there's something to be said about you know you and i are watching close to 100 films a year Mm. which is great and we love it and we're seeing loads of other filmmakers attempt to do what martin scorsese is trying to do and when we see someone really successfully pull it off i have such an extra appreciation for Mm. it And, and not just seeing 100 films a year criticizing them too mm. and when, when i when i'm yeah, half an hour to, in yeah and i almost am like everything's getting full marks i'm just going to close my internal critic book and yeah just kind of because when the film's the sort of average i'm very much got an internal monologue going in my head of yeah. why this isn't working and i start to form my answer yeah but with this i'm like i'm just gonna close this and like, just, just, just watch this stuff yeah yeah you can relax yeah yeah it actually reminds me that there was uh, i remember hearing the anecdote of a uh, art teacher or uh, some sort of art professor, whatever, or uh, some art course somewhere in the world where one of the professors gave students this uh, exercise to go to a gallery, find a painting and sit in front of it and look at it for three hours straight. Right, yeah. And, and it, you know, it's, it's an interesting exercise and obviously it was talked about in the idea of like attention span and stuff, but it's like, yeah, the first 40 minutes will be really uncomfortable. Mm. But then the longer you spend time with it, the more you will see and the more will unravel. And and by the you will be looking at a completely different painting by the time you finish that three hours. Mm. Now, Kills of the Flower Moon is nowhere near as difficult as doing something like that. Right. But there is something to be said that the longer you are spent in the presence of something, it it, 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 it is it is actually a testament to long films. Yeah. Because the flamboyant is why, it, why they should of exist. Why sometimes. long films should exist. There's yeah. nothing arrogant or indulgent about it. It is completely necessary for this story. Yeah. Again, guys. If you've seen Killers of the Flower Moon, we would really fans. like to hear, hear hear your opinions of it. We we, as you can tell, we both think it's brilliant, and and, and often like there's, there's some moments of humour in there. It's like yeah. towards oh, the end, the, the sort of bit, clumsiness of the, the communication. The bit that really made me laugh out loud was when the guy was like, you know, he's he's like at the the will writer, and the guy's like, you do realise that I now think you're going to adopt and kill those children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> oh, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's witty. It's it's funny. It, it's brilliant. Please let us know what you think if you have seen it by writing in to hello at pulpkitchenpodcast.com. Com. Before we wrap up today, Tyler writes into hello at popkitchenpodcast.com just like you can. And he says, Hi guys, I was at the London Film Festival last night for the opening gala of Killers of the Flower Moon mm. and wanted to share my thoughts. I thought the film was incredible. Yeah. The story really keeps you hooked to find out where it will all end up and the performances were great. Leo was great as always, but I wouldn't say it's his best like some would have said. Lily Gladstone, on the other hand, was the standout performance. For me, she played Molly very well. Mm. Just a little thought on the film. Uh, very excited to hear your review. Cheers, lads. Look 
forward to more reviews past 100. Tyler. Tyler, thank you so much. Oh, sorry, just one, one more thought. I know you've just it. Um, there, there's another thing the film does, which that it doesn't ever try to withhold a reveal of who's really bad and who's good. Mm. It's understood like really immediately, which yeah. I think, again, takes real discipline to go... You don't, I don't need to withhold this information from you and like, oh, is Robert De Niro the one yeah. pulling the strings? Like from the very beginning, he's like, you like girls? You want to come here? Yeah. You want to, what if you married her? And just sort of, you know. But like, what it does, I think, is makes you feel uncomfortable underneath his charm. Yes. Because he's a very, very charming, charming yeah. you know, genial. Smart, sharp. Speaks their language. Oh, and the use yeah. of sometimes subtitling yes, was, and sometimes uh, not yes, subtitling. very smart. Yeah. And, and even when it wasn't, you sometimes still sort of got exactly what they were saying That's without, it. yeah. I think it's, yeah, that's an interesting tool. Yeah. Anyway, that's all. Anyway, go see it. <laughs>